He would sit under an ancient mango tree and speak to the villagers about the value of the forest. The forest is our first home. The one we live in is our second home, he would say. Our parents give us life, but the forest sustains it. From it we get the four necessities of life, food, shelter, clothing, and medicine. It balances the air we breathe, cleanses the water we drink, produces the soil in which we grow our crops. It nourishes the spirit in the same way it nourishes the body. We should be endlessly grateful to it, every grove, every tree, every leaf. Ajahn took us to Taboo's cave, a sacred site of pilgrimage containing a sculpture that had been carved by nature. A limestone shape, like the body of a sitting Buddha, had grown up from the floor of the cave. From the ceiling, the shape of a head was growing downwards to meet it. Grace and I sat quietly in meditation. We knew this was a very holy place. The cave was alive with spiritual energy. It was a profound experience. When I came back home, Ajahn's understanding of nature mingled with what I'd learned from indigenous spirituality, and I became a born-again greenie. I remember saying in an interview at the time, it's all about belonging to the land, not destroying it. We must learn to become more aware of our connection to the web of life. That was the lesson of my trip to Thailand in 1986. So for many years, my spirituality was this rich mix of Buddhism and a kind of deep ecology and an infinity with indigenous spirituality. I meditated, I practiced yoga, I explored the desert, I communed with the dolphins at Monkey Maya, and I returned to Arjan's cave to replenish the sense of peace and understanding that I'd initially found there. I demonstrated in the southeast forests and the Blue Mountains, and my work was alive with images of the wilderness, Buddhist symbols, and the wise words of the Native American Chief Seattle, who affirmed Ajahn when he said, this we know, the earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. All things are connected. Whatever befalls the earth, befalls the sons of the earth. He wrote that in, eight, in the 1850s. I designed logos and t-shirts for Greenpeace and the Wilderness Society. And this was the time of my wild about wilderness, earth first, my om, and my peace designs. During that time, my commitment to the environment was absolute, but everything else in my life was in upheaval. My business collapsed, my marriage ended, and I began an 11 year long passionate relationship with Danton Hughes. Danton was an artist and a builder, and we fell in love. We created a beautiful house together out of recycled materials. We learned about permaculture and caring for the land. And we explored the ethos of living simply so others may simply live. I was learning, as Danton said, to walk my talk and tread lightly on the earth. This life was the antithesis of my marriage to Michael and the flamboyance of Flamingo Park. All my energy in those days had been directed outwards. Now, through meditation, therapy, and all manners of inner work, I was looking in, and I did not like always what I saw. The disintegration of my business and my busy, glamorous life brought with it a painful, dismantling of my ego and left me unprotected, insecure, 
and emotionally raw. However, if I have learnt one thing in this life, it's that this is where the juice is. It is where nothing is solid, where the ego is in tatters, where things fall apart, because from there you have two choices. You can shut down or you can truly open to change and transformation. Danton had struggled all his life with depression and on Easter Monday in the year 2001, he took his life and he took a large chunk of my life with him. Then began the dark night of my soul. I had to face my grief, despair, guilt and unbearable pain. My Buddhist practices became my only refuge. I had an old unread copy of Sogyal Rinpoche's The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying in the house. I read that book from cover to cover again and again. It became my Bible and it gave me comfort. I prayed to Sogyal Rinpoche's teacher, Jamyang Kensi Chochilodro. When I opened the book, his face beamed out at me with compassion and wisdom. It was a slow, painful journey of healing. I was haunted by profound, disturbing dreams and visions. But I didn't want anyone to stay in the house with me. I felt I was in the midst of a process that I needed to work through alone. Whatever came, I was going to deal with it. There were days when I couldn't get out of bed. My bones felt as heavy as my heart. All my old insecurities returned and I was plagued by fear. I was terrified I would lose my mind. My memory deserted me. I couldn't concentrate, couldn't remember prayers or teachings. I couldn't go out. I only felt safe alone in my house. And I lived in fear that I would sink deeper and deeper into depression. Yet through all this, I practiced. I meditated with a very distracted mind, but I did it. Drowsy, sluggish, but I did it. A wandering mind, always wandering, but I did it. Dharma was my drug, and I was proud of that. One after another, a string of Tibetan Buddhist lamas entered my life. They purified my house and my heart, and they helped to set Danton free. I remember dreaming one night that Danton was walking in a forest with Jamyang Kensi Chochilodro. They carried bows and arrows, and the wise lama was teaching Danton to focus his mind. That dream, that dream gave me comfort. Another turning point came when I met Deccan Geltsy Rinpoche. Rinpoche is here tonight. It's quite an amazing thing that he, he is always there when I need, needed him. It's quite a profound thing that Deccan Geltsy Rinpoche is here. He is a poem master, a Tibetan lama who specializes in the transfer of consciousness at the moment of death and in guiding the consciousness through the bardo or afterlife. He made a special trip to the mountains and I truly believed he released Danton's spirit. <laughs> 